Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon, who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? who was able to make war with him. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has a ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. and He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding Calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is six, six, six. If you have your Bibles, turn to that portion that we read together tonight. I will confess it was not my intention to actually deal with Revelation chapter 13. It is not a chapter one would naturally gravitate towards. But that's where we find ourselves tonight. And I'm very mindful, even in the reading of the chapter, that sometimes in various circles you can hear more of the beast than you can hear of the lamb. And when that takes place, then people's lives get very troubled and their spirits get very agitated. And because we live in such weird and wacky days, 
where the church is fed on such passages that people lack an assurance. They don't hear of the Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. And uh, although we live in those days as a church, we end up in a very unbalanced uh, use of Scripture. Like I said, there are people who can tell you more about the beast than they can tell you about the Lamb. And what we need, once again, is this. We need a balanced biblical Christianity. And in the life of a minister, although I'm taking this subject this evening, let me just say to you, if you ever got any ideas of how then the week works out for a minister, it works out with dealing with many things. You're dealing, obviously, with some spiritual needs. You're dealing normally with some practical needs that need to take place in the life of the church. You deal with people in their relationships. That comes up uh, often. You deal with people who are ill and sick. But I can tell you, not a week goes past where you don't have to deal with someone who's got a problem with the beast, with the mark of the beast. Do you know the wackiness, the troubled of Christian spirit? It's almost like a kind of disease which has held them. And although they're Christians, all I know is this, that their peace has been taken away, their joy has been taken away, they have concentrated on the wrong things, and that would be a section of one's week, normally in any conversation, dealing with the things as the Antichrist, the Mark, and the second coming of our Lord and Saviour. Now what I'm going to say tonight, I'll say it categorically, that most of these teachings are absolutely wrong. Wrong. And you may say here, but I don't agree with your teaching, Chris. I'll tell you again, you're wrong. And I'll tell you why. Because the teaching you've got is one that's troubled your heart. It's one that's made your spirit anxious. And the Bible tells us that if you've been taught such things that make you so anxious and so afraid, I can say categorically to you tonight, you're wrong. And you may say, I don't agree with your interpretation, but I know this. It will be one which will give you an assurance and a comfort. And such is the very strange thing in the life of the church. Do you know we got Christians which are more afraid of the beast than they got the fear of God? And there's only one thing that you need to fear tonight. And it's not to fear him who is the devil, not to fear even that place where people go, but you fear God. You fear God and you fear nothing else. Now I know tonight there are many pressures upon us and there's many pressures in your life. And to deal with something like this, which you say, how will it connect in my very living and how I live my life? Well, let me tell you, these people who this book was written to we're having the same pressures that you're under in your everyday life. But they were also under two other pressures. Two other pressures. They were having pressure from the synagogue in which they were being persecuted. We know that from the first three chapters. And they were also now having persecution politically. These twofold persecution had arisen upon them. And you need to know that this is something to understand. That when we deal now with the beast, in the verse 18, he was wisdom, let him who was understanding, calculate then the number. It's the number of man. And what we'll do tonight is simply this. I want to take a panoramic uh, view, a skyscraper view of this chapter. Then we're going to look at just one or two details. And then I want to show you for anyone here this evening. Because the only answer to such a creature tonight is that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's the only hope that you've got when we're dealing in the things of the world in which we live. And the first thing that is simply this in the panoramic view that we have is that when someone comes and talks to you about the beast, the first thing you need to say, which one? Which one? Because in that chapter, if you didn't read it, there are two. 
There's that when verse 2, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. And then you find in verse 11, and I saw another beast coming out of the earth. And you need to ask him the question, which one? Are you talking of the one out of the sea? Or are you talking the one you see out then of the earth? And then you need to know that there is then, which we want to talk tonight, of only one, the first one, which comes out of the sea, that we're being taught now something which we need to know. Three mistakes are made when we're dealing with, with this portion. And the first is this, that the big mistake that people make is the denial of such a creature. I want to put that to you, that when you come and you read and you've heard what's been read tonight and you go home, you can say that such a creature does not exist. But the Bible tells us there is such a creature. And what we're told here in God's word, but such is the world in which we live. Because people, you can believe almost anything today. You can be what is called a spiritual person. And it's kind of a fad these days to be a spiritual person. You know, I got someone who has a spiritual intuition. And you can believe anything you want spiritually except this one reality. There is such a creature as the dragon and the beast. And when you read chapter 12 and chapter 13, you've got before us that unholy trinity of the dragon and the two beasts. He is only ever aping the things of God. But I assure you tonight, you can believe whatever you want about God. You can believe all you want about Jesus Christ. And you can believe all those right things. And you can believe about the Bible and about the way of salvation. But tell people that you believe in such a creature who is evil and fiendish. And such one that you find here. And I'll tell you that's where it stops. I remember that many years ago. They'll accept everything else about this. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. Remember that when he came into this world. He came into the world to destroy the works of the evil one. And when you read of what took place, we looked at it last week, when the Lord Jesus Christ says that when he is lifted up, now the hour has come, the crisis in this cosmos, where he is cast down. And you read that great, wonderful work of Calvary. Let me tell you about Calvary. Calvary is the place where Jesus died for your sins. But that moment when Jesus died for your sins... So was that power of the dragon cast down. Remember that, cast down. And so it is that there is a creature and he is called the beast. And then secondly, it's another mistake that we make. And it's the fact then that you may believe in such a creature, but people make fun, don't they, of that creature. He's someone who is dressed in red. He's got his fork. He's got his two horns. He's uh, old Nick. And he's up to his little tricks. They have no idea of what is spoken of here. There's a beast which comes out of the sea and it is fiendish and it is horrible and it is powerful. And as you read here, just for an example, he is like the dragon. Chapter 12, verse 3, and another sign appeared in heaven, a great fiery dragon, and he having seven heads and ten horns and seven diamonds. Now look at that in verse 1 of chapter 13. Having seven heads and ten horns and on his horns ten crowns. And this great creature is one of power. He's got thrones. He's been given authority. And he's one now who is uh, complete and perfect in that kind of power which is given to him. And the third mistake that people make when they talk about the beast. And here's the big one. And you need to grasp it, is that uh, we're being told that he comes out of the sea. He comes out of the sea and he comes out of the earth. Because we're dealing now, are we not? Remember what happened in chapter 12 and verse 12. Rejoice, O heavens, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down uh, to you, having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. And the reality we've got here is this, 
is that we're being told now of the sphere in which now the devil is at work. And remember now, he is not just working in the things, listen carefully, in the heavenly realms. He is working in this earth. It is a work which is carried out here upon planet earth. And not only that, you need he who has understanding knows the number of the beast. It's the number of man. And he's working with the authorities and the powers and the principalities. And when we speak of that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, and do we stand not against principalities and powers and those heavenly beings? You must understand that it comes even that within this very world in which we live. Now I want you to know that because uh, we're living in wacky days. Wacky days. Where people have got their ideas of their spiritual warfare. I've told you many times uh, of, uh, they must have read a book. And of course, when you read these kind of things, we need to come against the powers. And uh, many years ago, there was a joint prayer meeting in the town. What we need to do is come against the powers. Let's get down to the castle. It was a stronghold, a power. Let's go down to the courthouse. It's a place of law, power. Let's go to the town hall, a place where decisions are made, power. And people then come and they, they walk around and they make these kind of great prayers coming against the, the powers. Wake up, wake up. The number of the beast is the number of man. And if you want to find him, he's always found in man. No, he works out his work in the things of man and humanity. When the Lord Jesus Christ came in this earth, every time he was confronted with the devil apart from the wilderness, where was it found? It was found in men and in women. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came and he dealt with the, the things of evil in this world, in those, what was against him? Remember what he says to Pilate? He says, I've got power to put you to death. No power unless it's been given to you. What he said to those religious leaders, you're of the father, the devil. When that day and that night came, it says that Satan entered in to then Judas and he works you know the number of the beast, don't you? It's the number of man. And he does his work and he finds it. But you need to understand, I know I haven't planned to say this, but look, he's in places, as we know, of powers and of rule and of ten horns and uh, as he has here and seven heads and ten horns, he is powerful. You need to know where he is. I remember many years ago, I, I shouldn't, I, I'm a terror, but I was having coffee one day in a cafe and uh, someone came in and said uh, that they were possessed and they wanted me to uh, do an exorcism on them. A strange providence, isn't it? That very morning I'd been reading Jeremy Taylor, uh, one of the Puritans, and he said, if you ever want to do an exorcism, he says, Make sure you know the name of the demon which is in you. So uh, the person came in and said, uh, I need this to be performed. And I said, well, before I can do that, I said, I need the name. Go back, come back to me when you find the name. About three days after, he came back, was in the cafe again, and there he was. He said, I've got the name. I said, what name is it? He says... It's Beelzebub. I said, I tell you what, we got a big one. We got a big one. Do you know what I think, I said? We've got the prince of demons. And you're telling me that the prince of demons is living in a one-bedroom flat down the bottom of Narbeth. You've got the wrong name. Come back and give me another name. Because here you've got a beast and he works in the powers and places of authority and places in high places. You've got to know of where he operates. And then I just want to say now, just, you know, to focus a little bit more on what then we're told, just to take a few things so you understand. In verse then 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, And I stood on the sand of the sea, 
And I saw the beast rising up out of the sea, having ten heads and ten horns, and on the horns the ten crowns, and on the, his heads a blasphemous name. Now look at verse 2, what he was like. A leopard, yet the feet of, and of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. Now you know that scripture interprets scripture, does it not? And that should actually take you way back to even Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel has a vision, does he not? There it is on his vision, verse 2, and the four winds of heaven were stirring the great sea, and the four beasts came out of the sea, each different from each other. There was the leopard, there was the bear, there was the lion, there was this awful creature. And you know and we know that every one of those creatures represented the great powers which were on this earth of Babylon and Persia and of Greek and of Romans. We're dealing now with powers and of principalities, those which are in th authority in the very things of this earth. Someone has said, and it's a very good thing, when you read Romans chapter 13, make sure you always read it with Revelation chapter 13. Now here it is. Let every soul be subject to the governing authority. For there is no authority except from God. And authorities exist and are appointed by God. And so it is, you know, that God has set upon these places. But in this world in which we live, there are those which have come against the church. And you find it there then in verse 2. And the dragon give him his power, his throne, and his great authority. And so it is, we're being told, of where he is working and seated. Uh, just for you to know that, because uh, the government and powers have not always been helpful in the life of the church. Look at church history. Look at it across the world. And the greatest slayers and persecutors, and the beast comes out of the sea. And he has been there, as we read. Look now in verse then 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And of all the world marveled and followed the beast. And in this very place in which we now live, in this world, you see, you find that uh, there's been a, a wound which is given to him. Now, these people were being persecuted by the authorities, by those uh, of Rome, on the seven hills, with all its power. Uh, but throughout the time, there's been that where the kingdom of darkness has been plundered. There's been a wound which has been given to it. And throughout the history of this very world, you will find that there have been moments and times where the church has known what it is to triumph. Actually, I, I wrote this little down from our catechism from the Heidelberg. When we pray that thy kingdom come, we're asking for the advancement of the cause of Christ. We pray that thy kingdom come, that destroy the works of the devil, every power that exalts against you, and all the wicked devices formed against your holy word. That's a prayer we pray. And you know in the history of this continent of Europe, could you ever have imagined it? where this continent, the, the, the powers of Rome, became a, a Christian continent. And, and the gospel came, and there was power, and there was a deadly wound to those which were in authority. And uh, there was a day where the church was strong and triumphed. Look, we don't live in that day anymore. This continent is gone. You could never have believed that we came to such a secular place. But it happens. Yeah, there's a story which took place here in Bethesda uh, over a hundred years ago. There was a traveller which came in uh, to this church and there was a baptism on that night. And as he wrote in his diary, he wrote this, knowing that people were testifying to the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, the enemy cowered that night. It was a day of prosperity for the gospel in the town of Narbeth. That was a hundred years ago. Not now. It was a time in this nation 
which this nation knew of triumph and revival which took place. Not now. And you must understand that because there comes that moment where this, which we live in, the liberties we've enjoyed, the freedoms we've known, the things which have taken place. But once again, the secular powers which have been all over this world, persecuting the church this night in Iran, persecuting the church in China this night, persecuting there in North Korea. And when you come and you think of the great persecutions, look, this was for the reason. Verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast and who is able to make war with them? And there is something which happens in this world in which we live. That's the world we live in, where we're being told to worship, to submit to the powers and authorities, where there are laws which are contrary to the things of God. And uh, the decrees that they pass, and this is powerful. And who can stand against it? Now, these knew of that. They were there on that day. And they had to come to a place and say, Caesar is Lord. And that's why it says, whoever says that Jesus is Lord, they shall be saved. And would not bow the knee even to Caesar. Now, you don't understand how perhaps powerful uh, these uh, governments and uh, people who are in authority, they really are. I don't know if you've ever read about the Second World War. Perhaps you have. But the effect on people like you and me, how a nation was swept. Hi Hitler, hi Hitler. You're not thinking of the SS. You're not thinking of those even in the government. Of the very common people and the things that they did that they could never have imagined themselves doing. Such was the pressure which was upon them. And who can stand? You think of uh, Russia and the great big country that it is. And for 70 years there was a Soviet Union. And throughout the whole of those countries there was the teaching of atheism. And they worshipped. And if you don't worship God, you're going to have to worship that state. And worship those which are above you until the very place. And I don't know if you've seen it, that when Stalin was in his prime, the person was too scared even to stop clapping. And the first one that stopped clapping was sent to the gulag. And they were scared because they had to worship. And who can stand against such a fool? And this is how they do it. This is how it comes. You're being told uh, of what happens. See, the devil has been cast down to this earth. He has risen now from, from the sea, from the turmoil, from the things of this world, the restlessness of man. He's been given these authorities and powers and thrones. And then we're told this, that they would worship him. But verse 5, by his mouth, by his mouth, Great blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. Always mark that down. 42 months. Throughout the book of Revelation, the interpretation comes to you from the book of Daniel. 42 months, uh, 42 days. It's that three and a half. It's the period of time from the Lord Jesus Christ coming on this earth to his coming again. And what he says, he'll do it by the mouth. Now, you may think that we are living in this little country and there's no guns pointed to our head. Look, the very things that we're being told, the very things our children are being taught, the things which are shown on the TV, the propaganda which is right before our eyes of lifestyles which are absolutely contrary, not only to biblical law, but to natural law, which God has put in. And there you find that children from the age of three, through the very books that they're reading in school and the things that they're seeing and the media. And he does it through those words. He does it through ideologies. 
He does it through the thinking and philosophies of men. He does it by captivating your mind. He does it with words. And so we're told here is that this beast, he comes and he has those words. And so it is that he is there to continue. And he does blaspheme, doesn't he? In verse 6, the blasphemy against God and the blasphemy against his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. All that you are holding today, the blasphemy, which is against God, against Jesus Christ, against the one who came into this world and who is God, and against then that which of his people. Do you not understand that when you watch your TV programs and you listen to people on the street, how many times in a week is the name of Jesus Christ blasphemed? It's, it's regular, isn't it? It's all the time. You know, I'm just waiting for the day when someone on Coronation Street says, Oh, Mohammed, what a place that will be. Or the day will come when someone on the radio will say, Oh, Buddha, I wish someone would say something like that. No, never a mention of such a name. Never a mention of those things. But they'll tell you of Christ. And they'll talk of the name of Jesus. And they'll take his name in vain. And it's the blasphemy which is against then God. And so you come and you live, don't you, in this world of, of what it is. And so he tells us, it's these powers and they're given powers. Powers in the media, powers in the arts, powers in the banking systems, powers there in rulers. And through their teachings, they are teaching you and they're teaching others and they're wanting to worship, bringing that to the worship of the beast. Now look in verse 7 and verse 8. Every single one of you tonight is going to be affected by the beast. There is no one here tonight, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, who's not going to be affected by the sheer influence. Do you understand the number of the beast? What is it? The number of man. Number of man. That's what you're being told. That from where we live, from what's taking place in this world, everyone's affected. Now in verse 7, he comes and he makes war, special war, which is against his church and against then the saints. And you know that because he wants to overcome them. But there is those who overcome. And the person who is a Christian is the person who needs uh, to overcome. But look in verse 7. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. Mark that down. Because if there's anyone who's not a Christian tonight and who has not given their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, every single one is under his authority. And every one, you see, will worship him. You know, you're living in a world where there are people who say, but I'm not clicked in to this world. I don't follow the mainstream media. I'm listening to other news. I'm not following the fake news. And these people, they stand, don't they, a bit outside of the natural kind of normal, you know, middle class kind of ideas of what life should be. They've got alternative lifestyles and uh, they've made sure that they're not going with the flow and they'll tell you I'm an anti-vaxxer and they'll stand on that and whatever it may be and then they don't uh, uh, have their children in schools just as well in these days by the way but they take them from society they want to go and live in a certain place draw themselves away from the world these people who say I've got my eyes open to what's taking place of the powers Listen carefully. You're under the power of the beast. Every single one of you. If your name is not written in the Lamb's book 
of life. That's the reality. You can be as alternative as you want. And you say that I'm not buying anything that these politicians are saying, great, you're under the power and you can't escape. Look at that in verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There is only one place this evening. Do you remember last week that the devil and the dragon was cast down from then heaven and no one this night could come and be an accuser of the brethren? The only place you've got to stand tonight is under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for your sin to be forgiven. And the only power that you'll ever have in your life to know something against the powers of the beast and the dragon and all that he comes is under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a book which God has made. It is a book of life. And it's the book of the Lamb that was slain. It's a book of life, but it's written in the death and the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's a book, I tell you this evening, that Jesus Christ carried with him to Calvary. There was a lamb which was slain from the foundation of this earth. And before God made this earth, he had a people which he knew were in his book. I tell you who those people are. They're people who have come to the Lamb. And they're people who believe in Jesus Christ. They're people tonight who have come to believe in him. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, your name is not in that book. And you say, that book, I need that book. Because you're the only hope you've got from ever worshipping then the dragon and the place he'll go and all that's destined for him. But God's got a people and he says those people, they're safe. They're safe from the power of the beast. Of the beast. And you know it. In verse 10, the only way I can interpret it is like this. Now those who dwell on the earth, um, verse, where am I? Verse 9, he was yours to hear, let him hear. Now verse 10, now he who leads into captivity, because that's what these people were, were being led to. They were being led into captivity. But he who leads into captivity, they shall be in captivity. And those, you see, who kill by the sword, one day, they, they will come and they will be killed, he says. The judgment will come and they'll be killed by the sword. Now, now, you need this news because here is the patience and the faith of the saints. It's like this in your life. There are certain things that you go through. And sometimes it's very difficult and it's very hard. And one of the reasons it's hard is because of this. You don't understand what is going on. You may have a child which has been born. And that child has got a, a different way of acting and thinking to yourself. And you're exasperated with that child. But then someone comes along and tells you that, look, your child has got this particular syndrome. Although it may still be a burden for you to carry, you can understand it. And because of that, you can cope with it. There'll be those of you, perhaps in relationships, and you find it difficult, and you don't know why the person is acting the way they're acting. But then it comes where they open up and you begin to understand. Now that's what you've got here. He says this world in which we live this very night is a world, you see, which is contrary 
And it's the world, you see, which is against the very things of God. And it's a world which is going to persecute God's church. And there's pressures upon us. And who can stand? That's why everyone who goes into government wanting to do good, somehow many of them fall, don't they? Because of the power of pride and of wealth and of whatever else it may be. There'll be that of the church, be very careful of the church, which joins itself with such secular powers. Billy Graham, at the end of his life, despaired of the fact that he had joined himself with a political elite. You come to a place where those of all good intentions, of those in power to make things better, have made things desperately worse. And that's why tonight it is even if you were to give power to someone just in a little organization, it just takes hold. Because there's another spirit which is abroad. And it comes out to the sea. And it's of man. And if you've got that here to here, this is the patience and the endurance of the faith of the saints. And we're living at this time, aren't we? We're living at a time not of strength, but of great weakness. But you've got patience because you know that that's the time that we live through. And you trust in him, and you believe in him, and he'll carry you through. You need to know the power of the Lamb.